Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us for this webinar on the future of international touring post-Brexit. My, my name is Elena Cavallero, and I'm a project manager at Extrax, based in Manchester, UK. Extrax is a UK-based development agency for the outdoor art sector. And this weekend, we were due to run our international showcase event in partnership with Stockton International Riverside Festival, one of the world's oldest and best international outdoor art festivals. If you have only joined us now, you will be able to find more information about the showcase, extracts and surf by clicking on the links below. We received more than 180 registrations for today, um, and it's great to see that so many of you are watching right now. Before introducing our brilliant speakers for today's session, I would like to run through a few practicalities. This session will run for one hour and 15 minutes, so until 3.45 p.m. if you're in the UK and, and until 4.45 p.m if you're living in Central Europe. We're also joined by many East Asian delegates today, so a special welcome and thank you goes to them for staying up so late. This is real dedication. Feel free to use the chat on YouTube to say hello, who you are and where you're from, as the live function does not allow you to see who else is here. For access purposes and also acknowledging that English is not the first language for a big number of listeners today, we have enabled captioning during all the keynotes. To activate your captions, simply click on the settings button on the screen, then subtitles, then English. Also, for access purposes, we'll all be describing ourselves. So, my name is Elena, she, her, I'm white with dark hair and I'm wearing a blue dress. If you would like to ask the panelists questions, please use the chat. I will make sure to read them out and at the end of the session. We're also recording the webinars and they will be available online following the showcase. Feel free to comment, post and tweet about this event using the hashtags Extract Showcase and Surf at Home. And make sure to follow Surf and Extracts on social media as we will be sharing follow-up resources and content. So, without further ado, let's get started with, it, with this afternoon's session, which is going to look at the practical implications of, Re of Brexit on international touring. The UK officially left the EU on 31st January 2020 and entered the transition period which will end on the 31st of December, 2020. Like all the cultural sector, outdoor arts has many concerns about the future of working in Europe and about the ending of freedom of movement. It is clear that UK artists want to continue touring in Europe, just as UK festivals and promoters want to continue to invite artists from Europe to work in the UK. So how do we make sure they are best equipped to do so? Today, the panel is going to provide some clarity on aspects such as work permits, visas, carnets, and taxation, and offer opportunities to reflect about what international touring will look like from next year from the point of view of international and British promoters and artists. The presentations will be followed by some time for Q&A, so I would like to invite you to post your questions to the panel in the chat section. So, I'd like to welcome you um, and introduce our four speakers. First off, Ian Smith uh, will open the discussion. Ian has been involved in the arts for over 30 years, having run two music agencies based in the UK with a presence in Vienna, Austria for the last 12 years. For eight years, he was also the national chair of one of the UK musicians in section. He is also a musician, live sound engineer, and international artist manager, working with artists across Europe. Most importantly, in this context, he is one of the three founders of UK Europe Arts Work, which is an incredibly useful website that was set up to limit disruption to the cultural sectors via the dissemination of accurate fact-checked information from all sides. Next, Alison King is Chief Executive of Creative Producing Organization Turtle Key Arts. Their work has a UK and international reach through a wide variety of innovative projects with many different collaborators and partners, currently including companies such as Occam's Razors and Julie Via, who both tour very successful outdoor arts shows, Flying Cloud, Slot Machine, Kezia Serrao and Smith Dance Theatre. Dom Keeping is producer for Inside Outdoor Set and Outdoor Arts Activate and is part of the team behind the touring show Sense of Unity. Since 2007, Inside Outdoor Set has presented the largest festival of predominantly free outdoor performance in Dorset. The high quality outdoor events have transformed lo locations and drawn over 150,000 people. The festival is biennial and was set to take place in 2020, but was, has naturally been postponed to 2021. 
Finally, Camille Beaumier is responsible for production and distribution at the French company Graziel, which uh, created into a large-scale aerial show, Place des Angers, amongst others, and also works with Moroccan company Group Acrobatique de Tangier. She worked as associate producer in international relations with Welsh circus company North Estate for eight years. So, Ian will introduce the session by looking at some of the practical aspects that are so crucial to international touring and will be followed by Alison, Dom and Camille, who will share information and reflections based on their professional experience. Ian, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, hi everybody, my name is Ian Smith. Um, as previously described, I've run two music agencies for the last 20 years. Big in, um, past with the Creative Arts General for the last 35 years. And for eight years, I was part of the Musicians Union as National Chair of the Folk Roots and Tribe Music Section. I'm uh, he, him, I'm Caucasian, wearing glasses, a white shirt, and I'm UK English, based in both the UK and also here in Vienna, Austria, where it's very hot at the moment. Okay, so what have we got to say about Brexit? Uh, the reason I started the... Um, uh, UK Europe Arts Work Info website was a deep sense of frustration, not only with what we have to deal with, um, both touring into Europe and from Europe into the UK, but also a sense that there was a lot of disinf disinformation and misinformation around, which were, were creating barriers to people being able to make decisions. So both musicians, uh, dancers, actors, technicians, managers, producers, and of course, people who were purchasing those services. So what to do? Um, I asked two colleagues that I'd known for a very long time, one of whom is an expert on carne. If you don't know what a carne is, carne is, I'll go into that a little later in the description. And another colleague, uh, who was um, for many years um, a certificate of sponsorship um, a guy in the UK and was also the um, UK music industry representative um, when the uh, UK government changed the legislation on what were called work permits back in the day, now called certificates of sponsorship. My two colleagues are Roger Patterson for Carnes and Mark Ringwood, who works on uh, certificates of sponsorship and visas. So that's the website, but what are we really talking about? The main problem we have at the moment is a lack of clarity. Surprise, surprise. Um, on top of the problem that COVID has brought us, we now have a situation where nobody really knows what is really going to happen. And that is the key problem. Um, people who are wanting to make plans for the future uh, on both sides, both people who are offering services and people who are purchasing services, do not know what is going to happen on the 1st of January 2021. We all want to have our creative industries working into Europe and of course working into the UK. So what are we looking at at the moment? We have in effect three or four main areas where there could or may or almost certainly will be a change um, as UK citizens will become third country nationals and European citizens will be treated in some way indefinitely differently to how they're treated now in terms of being able to travel into the UK and work. But also, we also need to look at the import and export of goods on a temporary basis. I'll come to that in a moment. Those are carnets. So what's happening with being able to work or even travel into um, the UK and into Europe? If you're a UK citizen post-Brexit, you will be treated, uh, we are post-Brexit now, but we're in the transition period, of course. But what will happen is come the 1st of January, 2021, unless there's some miraculous change, then you will be treated as a third country national. Now, I've heard from people, and I've also seen in the press, um, in many places, um, misinformation about this. We won't be able to go back into Europe, into different territories in Europe and, and work without a visa, without a work permit. 
That is both true and untrue. The reality is that in certain territories, you will be able to go and maybe work for up to 30 days within a one year without the need for any work permit or any visa whatsoever, as long as you're registered in that territory. In some areas, some territories, you will only be able to work for seven days in any one year without a visa or a work permit. In some territories, you will not be able to do that at all. So it's confusing. Uh, there's a little section on the website which helps a little bit with how you can um, find out whether or not you can work in a particular area. Coming back into the UK, which I'm asked a question I'm asked very often because I work with lots of non-UK artists, um, mixed media, musicians, anyway. The deal is this, although we don't really know, we think at the moment it may be a question of something as simple as a certificate of sponsorship from a UK based sponsor or it may be something like what is now known as the permitted paid engagement visa, which lasts for a month. Basically, we will all still be able to work in and out of Europe. There'll be more admin, more cost. The problem is we don't know what that is at the moment. And anybody who says they know, they are, they are not telling the truth. I was, I'm trying to be polite. Um, the, Newspaper and magazine and internet articles that we've seen over the last six months or so before COVID hit were saying, you can't work in Europe, you can't work in the UK, it's going to be impossible, it's going to be almost economically absolutely impossible. None of that is likely to be true in its totality. It will certainly cost more. It will cost more in time, energy and effort but you will certainly be able to work in and out of the UK, no problem. But uh, in life, there's always a but, yeah? Okay, well, but we have something called the temporary import and export of goods. I'm not talking about services, <clears throat> I'm talking about goods. So if you are a musician, you have to temporarily import and export your instruments whatever that might be. If you're a theatre company, you have to temporarily import and export your set, possibly, and a whole range of other things. But the other problem alongside this is something called um, VAT, or it's called different things in different places, in relation to merchandise. So if you're taking things to sell with your show, then you are now going to be treated as a third country national and you are also going to have to pay in advance the VAT on that material, note in advance, and um, you have to, um, using your carnet, which I'll explain what that is in a moment, um, justify your temporary export, your, not temporary, your export of that material and import back into whichever country you happen to be going in. So, I'll roll this back a little bit. What is a carne? A carne is simply this. Whichever country that you happen to be in, um, I should say before carne, before Brexit, customs never checked this because it was not necessary. However, after Brexit, you have a document. Uh, I'll use a piece of paper that's not a carne, but you have a document with a list of Items, if you're a musician, you have a list of every item that you have to carry with you, musical instruments, um, even gaffer tape, I'm not joking, gloves if you're a drummer, drumsticks, and those have to be on the list and you have that done at your local chamber of trade or chamber of commerce. The list is presented at customs when you leave the country and when you enter, uh, sorry, when you enter a new country. The customs checks your list, checks your items, off you go, enjoy. The, the deal is when you come back out, they also check. Uh, I'm not going to go into how carnets are actually done within this very short introduction. I've got about five minutes left, so it would take hours. Uh, but the deal is you have to have a, a documented list of the equipment that you're taking with you out of the country and back in the country. That will, of course, entail delays. Um, and also 
because at the moment um, you will be if you're with going to an EU country that's within Schengen you will be allowed to drive all over Schengen however if you're checked in another country not the country of entry that is going to cause problems as well but we'll not go there because I'm sure we're going to find solutions because we're creative arts so what I'm going to say now is what is the worst case scenario just coming into the UK I cannot address at the moment each individual EU state or whether or not the EU will decide to do some sort of deal for the creative arts post the transition period worst case scenario coming into the UK is that everybody will just be treated as a third country national and if for example it's like US artists or um, certain other countries, I'm just using the US as an example, then that is normally just coming in on a certificate of sponsorship. You find a sponsor in the UK, they'll give you a certificate of sponsorship and it's sometimes advisory to have a simple visa as well, but it's not a full, what they call a tier five creating and sporting visa, which is both expensive and not difficult to it can be difficult to get, but it's a lot lengthier process and it's a little more expensive. A permitted pay engagement visa will cost around £85 per person and then your sponsor. So I'm not going to go into too much detail as I promised. Um, there are other issues which um, I'll touch upon very quickly. Taxation and payment. At the moment, from um, information I've received recently um, through uh, British Embassy here in Vienna, is that the double taxation agreements for Europe and the UK have been ratified again recently. So there will not hopefully be any problems with double taxation agreements as we go forward, fingers crossed. Um, but there are other examples of things that people have never thought about or didn't, were not told, or maybe not even thought about. There is something called CITES, which is um, the um, it's uh, the organisation for the prevention of damage to endangered species and rare woods. So why am I talking about endangered species and rare woods? Well, if you've got musicians in your company that are carrying instruments that contain perhaps rosewood or ebony uh, or um, other items, that has to be now checked. If the item in question, the uh, guitar or whatever, or perhaps a piece of set design has some rare wood in it, it is like, unless it has the correct certification, that will be confiscated potentially. Yes, afraid so. That's another unintended consequence of Brexit. I'll use a musical example again, a very quick one, because I've got three minutes left, I think. Um, I was told recently, uh, because since we launched the website, um, which is totally free to use, it's um, self-funded by myself at the moment. So just to let people know if they want to check it, we try to fact check it as much as possible. It's free to use. There's, that's, we're just doing it to try and make things easier. So we were recently contacted by the logistics person for an orchestra based in the UK who has a number of concerts in Berlin next year. Yeah, great. Normal, fantastic. Anyone who knows anything about orchestras knows that they have to bring in all the instruments, usually separately to the artists, believe it or not. So they were told that they've got their gig in Berlin, but because the specialist um, uh, customs agency that works with this sort of thing for mass clearance of instruments is in Frankfurt, they have to fly all the musicians to Berlin and all the instruments to Frankfurt and then take them over the road back to Berlin and then when they finish they have to take the instruments back to Frankfurt and send the musicians back. The reason I'm saying this is that it's about time as well and logistics because we all know in the arts industry we're all about sometimes very last minute trying to keep things moving, theatre companies, circuses, musicians. We know that to get people moving and to make our lives economically sound and viable and the companies in question viable, we have very much to fit everything in as tightly as possible. What else? It's not all doom and gloom. We will all be able to work afterwards. 
nobody really knows what's going to happen in the next few months, let alone the impact that the COVID has that COVID has had generally in the arts um, uh, community. And given the state of the negotiations between the EU and the UK, and I'm not going to make any political point at all, except to say, that's what I'm trying to say. I'll do a visual description. I was looking startled and didn't know what the hell is going to happen. Startled expression. So that's all I'll say for now. Um, obviously, the website's there and I'm here for the Q&A afterwards. And I'm now going to pass back to my colleagues. Thank you. Ian Smith, UK Europe Arts Working Fund. Thank you very much, Ian. That was, um, yes, a lot of food for thought. And it seems like we're just gonna have to keep learning really in the next years and mostly keep talking to our international colleagues and make sure that they know that we want to work with them. Um, so next up is Ali King from Turtle Key Arts. Hello everyone. Thank you, uh, Ian, and thank you, Alina. I'm Ali from Turtle Key Arts. I identify as she and her. I'm a white female, um, I have a, a round face, wearing dark brown glasses, dark hair that's piled up on top of my head, and I'm wearing a black um, top with sort of spread out floral images on it. Uh, really pleased to be here today talking to you. Um, obviously, I've got a little uh, PowerPoint in a minute, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Turkey Arts, as Alina so brilliantly said, is a performance arts company and we support artists to do our work. We've been extensively and very freely touring around Europe for a number of years with absolutely no issue trucking around for a whole summer in our vans. We produce mid-scale and small-scale work, so we're very used to travelling in either vans that the company's own, driven by the stage manager or sometimes a rigger or the former, and being self-sufficient and containing it. So I'm now going to share my screen so I can sort of explain a little bit more, and um, I do have a lovely PowerPoint uh, for you all. So um, here we go. So a um, little bit of information just about um, Turtle Key, which I think has been um, explained very well earlier, but it was just to sort of get a sense of the scale of work that we do. Um, these are sort of companies that we produce. So we work with circus, dance, physical theatre companies, and um, as I said, they tour all around the UK and internationally. And we've had a very good relationship with Europe, going to many festivals. And then obviously going further afield. So we are used to doing carnets to go to Australia and other countries like that, but obviously have welcomed and enjoyed the freedom of touring around Europe, as so many of us I'd imagine that are in this conversation today have. Um, so we have a couple of productions planned touring for indoors to Europe in 2021. Occam's Razor, the Aerial Circus Theatre Company, and Jodie Vianne um, Dance Hand-to-Hand -hand Acrobatic duo and they have to with specialist equipment uh, need certain sort of needs to meet their festivals whether they're indoors so I'm showing sort of two images on the screen of the sort of work and how technical it can be and the same for outdoors work Occam's Razor have a very large scale show belly the whale that's a great big tipping seesaw and Jodie Vianne have a dance piece that's very physical very dramatic they need to tour their own floor so what does it mean for us? So I thought I'd talk to you sort of about that, the impact for us and the things that I was learning. So before COVID hit, I'd obviously probably like many of you, been searching and scouring government websites, tuning into what the Independent Theatre Council found out about Brexit and could share, the same with UK theatres, attending many courses and kind of seminars about this. And obviously COVID kind of brought all of that research to a sort of halt, we obviously had work that was going to tour this summer, which um, what was pleasing about that was that obviously with a stay of sort of execution to Brexit being implemented meant that there was a very warm welcome from Europe wanting us, but already there were signs of maybe the complexities that were going to come. So sort of key things that we'd sort of started to discover were, you know, what is the impact of the work that you're touring? So as I've said, obviously we're in our own vans, we are um, normally driving around with the stage manager or technical manager driving the van with the performers in it so that we're minimizing our carbon footprint. We tour with our own trust specialized equipment. Sometimes we have additional hired equipment from lighting companies. We maybe hire, you know, on an ad hoc basis per festival or venue tour rather than for a whole summer. 
Um, obviously, we normally moved very freely with our driving licenses we had. Obviously, the travel insurance was um, incorporated into what we had in the UK um, for the vehicles. Um, and obviously, we loaded our vans and beyond checking them for anything illegal that may have been put in it without us knowing, we were free to kind of go. And the logistics of where Performer lived and where they were from didn't matter um, if they were from the EU. So I'd started to look at that and so I'd started to think about, okay, where do my performers and company members live? What's the impact of that? And, you know, the, the kind of awful reality is that actually as a UK company, you're going to almost feel better off employing a European artist either living in Europe or based in the UK with status to remain. Um, so it's getting that down so you can make sure you've got the right visas. It's then also looking at what we can do around driving licenses, making sure we've got the right paperwork in place, needing travel insurance for vehicles, um, you know, the correct green cards, etc. travel insurance for the company now. And then really coming back to what Ian was highlighting, this carne situation. Because obviously we load our vans and off they go, but it's what set and props and equipment and costumes you need to transport, knowing their value and origin. Um, knowing exactly what you had in your van, making sure you had a list. The length of time we're going to be away, I've been hearing horror stories of how long you can stay in countries, it's still very unknown. So looking and going, okay, well, what if that includes holiday time that artists might want? You know, am I going to have enough time? Normally we tour from April to September throughout Europe quite consistently. Um, and then looking at sort of, you know, other factors like that. So looking at additional costs in order to be able to make sure your car now gets unlocked. Before it leaves the UK, that you go to the right place to collect it, collect it. Um, so I was allowing extra staff hours, um, making sure that the technicians had time to do that. And also the big question, which Ian alluded to, around selling um, any merchandise. And for a small company or any small sort of performance arts companies or even individual artists, that fear of having to sort of deposit a large sum of money and then trying to get it back. So lots of fears, lots of questions and lots of unknowns. So I was, as a producer, was thinking, OK, well, how can I approach that practically and what solutions can I come up with? So the next thing that I was going to sort of share with you were some sort of top tips that I'd either found out, researched, been told about or started to think about. And obviously, as I said, this research now is a little bit outdated because I was doing this sort of January to March when I thought I was going to have a summer tour and already even getting inquiries to 2021. And then obviously COVID has kind of stopped play. And like many of you, I'm sure we've all been focusing on what does a post-COVID performance world look like, let alone the implications of Brexit. But these are some top tips I've picked up. I decided we've been hearing different things. You could get one car and a per show. You could um, make your vehicles travel in convoy. And I was already thinking, hang on a minute, what if someone got sick? What if they got split up? What if a vehicle broke down? So I already decided that even though it's going to be a further cost implication, we were going to get a car and aid per vehicle. We were going to allow extra time, employ our tech team for extra days to make sure they could prep and pack the equipment, pick it up from the higher company if there was any. Because obviously the big thing I'd sort of been told was that if you were hiring equipment, be really clear about you knew its value. Because they were saying actually it's so much easier now for customs and border controls to actually google the cost of something so be real in those costs and know what you're doing so i was going to allow that time um i was going to send the performers and the personal luggage separately so that it eluded any issue of having to know what on earth someone had packed normally we take all our luggage in the vans now my concern about that obviously then is there's a different concern of the environmental impact that we've worked so hard over the years to try and counteract when touring. I was going to really know in advance exactly what my performance nationality and residency status was. So hopefully I could make that process of visas and touring easier. I was going to overestimate my costs for this because obviously at the moment we still don't know, but I've been told roughly maybe a thousand per carne, extra equipment costs, visas. So I was thinking, okay, my two vans, 3.5 tons on a practical level, loaded and ready to go. I was probably going to look at an additional three to four thousand pounds for a tour to make sure that I could have all that paperwork in place. No, I don't know if that's right yet or not. So I was going to build that in and split that over my festival uh, costs. Also, then obviously now having to take into account the impact of COVID, you know, what are the social distancing measures needed? You know, how should my performers travel and what's safe? And then the other practical thing was allowing extra time 
to actually allow each vehicle to get to its destination. So whereas, I don't know, if I had a gig in Belgium, I might set off from the UK, let's say my getting day was Thursday, I'd set off probably Tuesday afternoon. I'm going to set off Sunday or Monday. So I've got longer time until I know to actually reach those destinations, arrive and be safe. Now, of course, all of these things that I'm talking about and all of these concerns and all of these worries all incur extra costs and um, an extra time. And how do you do that? Most of the festivals, even though there's a warmth and a desire to still program English companies and British and UK companies, because obviously you've built up connections and contacts with festivals, you've built up relationships and they want to have your next show and your show after. And that's really fantastic. They were all saying to me, any Brexit costs are down to you. And I understand because we don't know what those costs are. As Ian was saying, we don't know. There's no, you know, you, you, you say we haven't got a crystal ball. We haven't been given that information yet. So for sort of, a, if you like, relative terms, because we don't use great big transport and, you know, um, trucking companies, we are small to mid-scale touring companies doing it ourselves. We've had a level of freedom that we've taken completely for granted. And now it's like, okay, well, we are still going to tour. But it's just what do I need to be thinking about worst case scenario and then how practically can I put my producer hat on and go, well, I'm going to really make this work. And it does. It sounds very doom and gloom what I'm saying, but I think that's the research that I've done to date. I'll be picking that conversation up again. Um, I think uh, I'm with Ian. We will tour and we will make it happen. And you and you are, and you are obviously want to have us um, still come over and be part of that, that you know, shared language and creativity and as Ian said we're great at finding creative solutions so these are some useful and helpful links that I'd found and we're starting to look at some really good organizations that you can kind of turn to and as, as I've put Ian's one up there as well and um, so yeah I think I think it will be possible I think the key things to take away are going to be more time um and more planning so from a company point of view if you're an independent artist or you may be just an artist working with one producer there's going to be extra administrative costs and burden and that's going to be hard to swallow and time i think the key is no longer can we be as reactive because i've done it you've been at one festival and suddenly very late booking for another festival that's going to be harder and you're going to have to really look at your contract and make sure that, you know, if the Brexit costs are yours, you know what they are and you can swallow them. And you've quoted your price accordingly, but of course, obviously taking into account the pricing that you don't price yourself out of the market. So it becomes easier to book a company from France or Belgium or Germany because they're cheaper than you. So there's still things to be concerned about, but I'm confident that we will tour in Europe and I'm determined to, um, because art is all about breaking down barriers and borders and sharing our experiences. So I hope that's useful. I can share this presentation. There's my email address if anyone would like to get in touch with me. Um, we are still learning and finding out and discovering like all of us. So I'm sure a lot of what I've said is what everyone else kind of already knows, but I'm hoping um, that it's useful. And my really closing points would be allow yourself time, really know where your artists and company members are from, be really honest and realistic about what's in your vans, what needs to travel, what equipment you've got, dot those I's and, dot and cross those T's to start with so that we can really know that we've got everything right and get all the paperwork and your ducks in order. And I think then hopefully if it's not, doesn't, you know, finish you off administratively or cost you too much, we should be able to continue touring in Europe. So I hope that was useful. I think I'm within my time and I'm around for questions and, I'll, and uh, afterwards as well. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, this was great. Um, I mean, yeah, lots, um, lots of points. And I think it will be great. I think what I've not mentioned is that um, as extras, we are looking to continue doing some work around Brexit. So um, if you do have any thoughts around you know, what we've been discussing, you know, I was thinking about what Ali was saying around, you know, festivals saying the artists will have to pick up the costs. Um, you know, we, we're really interested in hearing everybody, uh, everybody's thoughts and views, um, both from the festival perspective and from the artist perspective. So feel free to 
email us and I think we'll start, we'll keep gathering this kind of material because it's, yeah, it's really, really useful. So uh, Dom is next. Dom, welcome. Thanks, Elena, and thanks, uh, Ian and Ali. Um, so I'm Dom Kippin, uh, he, him. I have a, a black t-shirt on, I've got black rimmed glasses, a, a graying beard and fading hair. And I'm sat in my bedroom upstairs hiding from my noisy children in Bournemouth. Um, so I'm the outdoor arts uh, producer for Activate, based in Dorchester, um, within which my main responsibility is as festival producer for Inside Out Dorset. Uh, we have been programming work in Dorset since 2007 in the festival, um, and I think we would say that we are a proudly European festival. Uh, we have had uh, European artists performing since the first festival. We had Polish artists uh, in the No Fort in Weymouth and then since then we've had a great relationship especially with artists from France and the Netherlands and Belgium. So um, Brexit for us was um, a real sort of statement. I think we wanted to ensure that we continue to programme artists um, from the continent um, going forward. That said then, when we uh, got to COVID, we obviously uh, had to postpone our festival, which was due to happen in a few months in September. Uh, that was put back a year to September 2021. Um, and as a result, we're having to think more about what will happen in terms of bringing over the artists that we want to programme, that we maybe thought we had a couple of years to work on. Um, so one of our first acts during that postponement was to contact all the artists that we had um, agreed to program um, and uh, exchange sort of pre-contracts with them um, as a sort of uh, act of uh, solidarity um, to those artists to show that, that we wanted to continue with the program that we had planned pre-Brexit. Um, we paid our deposits with those artists and are looking forward to welcoming them to Dorset in 2021. Um, we have roughly 20 to 30 European artists programmed within the festival for next year. Um, so a lot of the planning now is looking at our, our budget and how that will work. I think for us as a festival, we are um, actively pursuing uh, registering for a certificate of sponsorship. Um, it seems the most practical way to bring people into to perform in the festival at a reasonable cost. Um, this is something we've, we've looked at in the past when we've worked with uh, dancers, say, from uh, Southeast Asia and things like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a useful thing, I think, for festivals to have uh, in general, but certainly going forward, it will be uh, a priority. I think in terms of that, as well as from what Ali was saying about where the costs lie, I think we have certainly decided this year that we, you know, we want to the Bre Brexit was not the decision of our European artists. So we want to <laughs> ensure that, you know, they're not, uh, it's not then uh, a hit on them. So yeah, the, we're looking for the cheapest ways to make that possible. Um, yeah, we also, as Elena said, we also produce a show, um, Sense of Unity, which is a touring show, um, uh, collaboration between World Beaters based up in the northeast of the UK and um, Dundu from uh, Germany. Um, and that is going to become harder for us, um, certainly in terms of carnets. Uh, Dundu uh, are a puppetry company who bring in um, you have high freight costs anyway, given the size of the equipment they're using. So um, it, this is uh, another thing that we are starting to look at of how how that can that cost can be maintained without making the show too expensive to program. Essentially, um, I think uh, that is an unknown at the moment, um, as Ian explained. Um, and I think going forward, it's going to be. Uh, important for us to look at look at ways that we can reduce these costs in general. I think it will lead possibly to more 
programming collaborations in general um, for festivals in the UK um, in terms of us wanting to program acts coming over so they're not having to pay multiple times um, that the, their costs their costs coming into the UK cover a, a number of shows that partnership working I think is is another important aspect for us because as well as obviously programming um, acts from Europe um, uh, coming in um, we have a long standing relationship with a number of festivals and other groups in Europe. We have um, collaborated on a number of European partnerships. Uh, most recently, uh, we had a two year partnership called LAND. Uh, this was a partnership with Ural in the Netherlands, uh, the Citron Jeune in France and Plaque in Hungary, um, which focused on uh, bringing together artists um, and uh, landscape um, organizations uh, getting artists to work in in those areas this was funded by creative Europe um, obviously now that we um, we are leaving there we cannot lead on a creative Europe bid so we have to think creatively on how we can still maintain that um, that could be that you know as an organization you write your application and then you find a partner organization who will in Europe who will uh, act as your lead partner on that, um, which is something we've um, we've certainly looked at doing. Um, the other partnership we have is a thing called Green Carpet, um, which is um, not European funded. Um, it's only funded by the partner festivals. Uh, that is ourselves, Chaspier in Belgium, uh, the Citron Jeune again, and the Chamarand. Um, this is a a collaboration where we commission a new work that is created on site in each of those uh, festivals through a residency program um, and then it goes into their program at the following festival. Um, previously in our first year we programmed Les Souffleurs, a French company who created a really interesting work um, around uh, wolves and animals um, and that was a really nice partnership um, and easy maintain. This year we have uh, been fortunate that Red Herring, um, a UK based company uh, for Pascal Straton and Kim Tilbrook uh, were commissioned to create a piece called Whistlers. Um, they were due this year to be holding their residencies um, across Europe, creating the work um, before going into the festival season. And unfortunately, again, due to COVID, that has all been put back. So um, there are there are a number of issues, I think, then that are raised again with that on uh, how those residencies work, planning, uh, the timing of those, uh, what equipment's been brought over and brought back again that need to be looked at. Um, I'm sounding vague because I think, I don't know how other festivals, other people watching feel about this, but I think during the last few months, minds have been so focused on COVID preparations and budgeting for um, any extra work that needs to be taken in there. I think we've all taken our eye a little bit off the Brexit situation um, and what is going to happen with that. And I think it's only just now that we're beginning to realise that there are um, uh, so, so many more things that we need to arrange and uh, deal with from a administrative level, a HR level, for example, if you're a sponsor, there's a huge amount of extra responsibility um, in terms of um, ensuring the, uh, the immigration status of your artists and monitoring that during the period of their stay through to um, the discussions around when we're issuing contracts and deal memos of um, who is responsible for those payments. You know, I have a number of deal memos out there at the moment which have travel costs in. There's no conversation yet around carne costs, how much that's going to, how much that's going to bring in. So um, without going too much further, I think, I think it's that I th it's, it's really important to when we're programming uh, through to when we're budgeting is to consider these costs are in, uh, imminent uh, and there is going to be a lot of um, 
partnership working that we're going to need to do both within the UK and with our partners in Europe to ensure that artists can continue to come over here to perform in festivals like uh, Stockton. I think I'm going to leave that there. Thank you so much, Dom. I'm just thinking that you're doing such a great job. I have no questions left for you because you're covering everything I was uh, <laughs> I was going to ask you, which is great. Uh, we're getting lots of great feedback from uh, the audience and uh, I'm going to be asking a few questions that are coming in. So keep asking because um, I'll put the questions to the panel just uh, after Camille's presentation. So um, over to you, Camille. Okay, hi. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I am Camille Beaumier. I am now based in the, in the south of France, working for two companies, one touring indoor circus, Groupe Acrobatique de Tanger, specializing in Moroccan acrobatics. And the other one is Company Gratiel, who performs large scale uh, outdoor work aerial outdoor work. Um, both companies have uh, a long history of working in the UK and so have I because I was a producer and international development uh, person for Nofit State Circus before I moved back to France. I was with them for 10 years. I think Elena mentioned it was eight. I'm not sure anymore but it felt like 10 anyway. Uh, in a good way. Um, so UK and France or UK and European collaborations have always been at the heart of my practice and, and everything I do. Um, and that started with Nofit State Circus. So I think you've received my presentation, Elena? Yes. Can we can go to screen two, touring Nofit State's work. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just briefly talk about um, one key example, which I think is, is quite important, uh, which was uh, producing the tours for Block. I think it's a lot of you have seen, I imagine. It's been all over the UK and all over Europe. Um, and uh, this afternoon, I just decided to really look at the numbers of where where we toured Block, and it's quite interesting. In 2016, we did 25 performances in the UK and five shows in Europe. In 2017, we did two shows in the UK and 29 in Europe. In 2018, we did 27 shows in the UK, 25 in Europe and seven in the broader international, so that, that can be Asia or Australia or the US, for example. And then in 2019, after I left, there was three shows of Block in the UK and 31 shows um, in Europe. So, I, I mean, I think that really shows, um, and this is over four years of touring. I think this really, it's really important and it really shows how for UK artists, and I think especially in the outdoor and circus world, European touring is really crucial for the survival of artists and companies and, and for the longevity of the work because making a, a piece of outdoor work or, or a circus shows um, costs a lot of money and the longer you tour the work, uh, the, the more able you are to um, uh, recuperate your investment. Uh, and and I don't think Nufit State could have survived for the 35 odd years it's been alive without touring the work outside of the UK and mainly in Europe. Um, so so there needs to be ways there needs to be ways for for art, UK artists to continue to be supported, taking their work outside of the UK. Um, looking at the, the current work that I do, and we can go on to the second next page, Elena, if you, if you want. Uh, now I work with Groupe Acrobatique de Tanger, 
and with them, I mainly uh, tour one of their shows, Halka. Uh, and for many, many years, we have taken the work into the UK um, in collaboration with Crying Out Loud. So Crying Out Loud have done um, massive work bringing into the UK a uh, contemporary circus and Groupe Acrobatique de Tanger has been one of them and last year we did a tour, gosh from the top of my head we went to Poole, the, the lighthouse in Poole, we went to, um, blah, 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 blah. I can't remember all the dates and we ended up in London and that's another uh, um, you know, part of our touring work that is, is important to us is going into the UK and and meeting UK artists and UK communities. With Graziel, it's a bit different. So Graziel is the producer of one of the major outdoor shows called Place des Anges. Uh, Place des Anges has performed twice in the UK, once at Piccadilly Circus Circus. And again, that was in collaboration with Crying Out Loud and Rachel Clare. And the second time for the um, UK Capital of Culture in Hull in 2016. And we've done other things in the UK, like the uh, opening of St Pancras Station when it re reopened after the, all the refurbishments. And this year we had a lot of projects um, to happen in the UK this year and the next. And I think in the UK we've always found a place where monumental projects can happen, um, where magical, spectacular and unexpected experiences can happen. And, and that's quite different from what uh, we, we do in Europe, I think. In Europe there are a lot of festivals and you go to a festival and you perform your show, whereas in the UK there are perhaps less festivals that can book huge shows, but then there are all these other events like uh, Capi UK Capital of Cultures or anniversaries that really invest in the outdoor sector and, and, and where we can really collaborate and set up incredible things. Um, so as I, as I was saying this year, we had uh, a number of projects planned in, in the UK. Uh, up until now, the Brexit implication has not been in the back of my mind because we were going to do our shows this year and everything was going to be brilliant and easy uh, and everything has stopped. Uh, we've talked about postponing the work, uh, the projects to next year with our partners. Um, that happened during the confinement and, and I think, I mean, personally, I've been so busy and terrified and overwhelmed by, by, the, by the current situation that I, I didn't even start thinking about. And I think I kind of forgot about Brexit a little bit and what implications this would have on our, uh, you know, projects in the UK. And now that I start thinking about it, I think, well, okay, now there's this that we, we, we are all going to have to deal with as well. So I, at this stage, I, I don't know um, if the projects we had set up for this year and are hopefully going to be rescheduled next year will be possible when we find out what the Brexit implications will be. Uh, my first thought was, okay, visa, visa, uh, yeah, okay, let's try and find some information about that because we are groups of 30 to 40 people when we, we travel in our company, big groups. Um, the first info I found out was that visas were going to be 250 euros each and I thought, okay, that's us not performing in the UK for a while because, you know, where do you find this extra money? It's huge on a budget. Um, and then thanks Ian, okay, certificates of sponsorship, brilliant, that might be an option. 
Um, but can an organization, I know there is a, limit, a limited number of certificates of sponsorship you can apply for as an organization. Does that mean that UK festivals and bookers will prefer booking or bringing in small companies to start with? We don't know. Uh, so the way I the way I think about it is that we're going to have as companies we're going to have to think about touring in the UK in the same way as we think about touring in the US or in Australia or in Asia, which we do a lot of. So that's quite straightforward for us. We 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 know how to pack a container. We know how to do a carne. We know how to do all of these things the the issue is going to be that we will probably have to ask our uk partners uh and presenters to bear the additional costs we will do the extra work but in terms of any visa costs if there are any or applying for certificates of sponsorship any carne costs any additional insurance cost because that's also something that you know touring outdoor and touring circus we have to be very very careful about medical care how will that work um don't know uh invoicing vat that's going to have an, an additional implication um so again i think we'll we'll probably deal with it in the same way as we deal with you know Australia and ask the, the presenters to bear these costs and then I've, I've been I've been thinking a little bit about what will it mean for UK artists going into Europe uh, as as I said uh, you know we need to find solutions for UK companies to continue to tour into Europe it's crucial for their survival. Uh, I think there is a, a, a huge role for the UK sector to facilitate that, um, to um, inform European bookers about the implications for them for the time being. That's something for you know the arts councils the the british council organizations like extracts i think to really work closely with the with bookers to reassure them to guide them and and to support them uh i think there is also um something we need to think about which is uh, in the in the outdoor world it's important for companies to do self-promoted tours or self-promoted performances in Europe like Tariga for example where you can be seen by a lot of presenters how can suddenly companies bear all of these additional costs when you take your own work to a, a big off festival or fringe festival in Europe to to gain visibility and how can the sector arrange bursaries or support uh, UK artists going into, into Europe. Uh, and, then, and then vice versa, how, how can uh, the um, European artists safely continue to promote their work towards the UK and not go, okay, pff, I'll, I'll, I'll just not do that for a bit. It's important that we maintain crossovers between European artists going into the UK. Uh, yeah, there's so many, so many questions. I think the French Alliance, the Goethe Institute, Institute Ramon Lul, for example, have got a key role as well to play in getting artists from their own countries into the UK. And the, and the other thing I've been thinking about is I can understand that at the moment, uh, European presenters may ask UK companies to bear the costs of the additional costs of Brexit. But eventually, 
I think it's going to have to be the European festivals to bear these costs because when we are booked by an Australian festival or an Asian festival, it's their responsibility to cover the costs of the, you know, carne, visas, etc. And eventually European festivals are going to have to do the same. So I think UK artists at the moment, when uh, relationships or bookings that may have been cancelled by the coronavirus are being postponed to next year. Yes, I think the artists need to bear these costs, but they're going to have to be a transitional period when these costs get transferred to the booker. And we need to be careful not to get into a habit of UK companies absorbing all of this this cost because if that goes on for too long then there'll be no going back. I think that's one of the last things I wanted to say. Thank you Camille. Um, should I stop? I, I've stopped sharing the screen. I think um, a lot of the things that you were saying were also being mentioned in the questions in YouTube. Um, First of all, we had uh, a big debate on the chat, on the Zoom chat about certificate of sponsorship after uh, the point that Jeremy raised. So perhaps I'll let Alison and uh, Ian cover that. So I'll just uh, read out the question or well, actually the point um, and we'll cover just because it just feels like there is a lot of knowledge to be shared and um, perhaps that will be beneficial to everybody. So Jeremy was saying, um, the problem with certificates of sponsorship is that you have to be uh, registered with home office, which cost 500, 500, uh, 500 pounds 10 years ago. And it's quite slow, so it means the smaller arts organizations or those who only invite international artists occasionally. Um, so Ian, and Ali, I think you had some uh, some views on these. Sure, shall I go? Uh, yeah, Ali? you go in. Mm. Okay, uh, I've been a sponsor for about um, fifteen years, and this has changed a little bit over that time. There's basic fee for the sponsor that I've just checked it actually. It's five hundred and thirty-six pounds. That actually isn't for one year. That's usually for three years. Um, so when you become a sponsor. You take on certain responsibilities um, and those responsibilities include a lot of reporting and uh, administration to check that the artists whoever they may be or the people coming into the country to work into the UK both enter the country legally and you must check that they have left the country as well one part of the chat that we were having on offline so to speak was that if you are a sponsor and I'll speak from a music point of view for a moment if you have multiple sponsors, say a band or an artist is working with different promoters, then whose is the responsibility to check the movement of the artist in the country, in the UK? So that you would be held liable to make sure that the artist officially leaves the UK after their work with you or goes on to their next um, engagement. Um, and something Camille was saying as well, which I'm sorry, I'll just jump on this whilst I remember it, is that about visas and visa costs, I've mentioned a couple of times a permitted paid engagement visa. Now this allows entry into the UK for up to one month and is a cost of now, I just checked, it was £95, so that's around €110 Euros per person. And that allows entry and work for up to one month. So it's complicated. And something somebody else said about how many um, you can only get a certain number of uh, certificates if you're a sponsor. It's true at the beginning, but if you run out of certificates during your, a year, you can request more as a sponsor. Yeah. So it's not an issue um, in terms of worrying about whether or not the sponsor's got enough certificates to um, encourage them to bring people in. Sorry, Alison. No, I was just going to say it's very similar. I mean, we at Total Key Arts with Occam's Razor with Belly of the Whale, one of our before living in France, but she was Brazilian. So we needed to get sponsorship and actually had no state gave us a lot of advice because it was new territory for us. And we auditioned and employed her quite late um, in the creative, you know, 
getting ready for creative process. So I'd say again, it's it's time. So if you know that you're going to have artists that could be from countries like that or now obviously EU, get yourself registered as a sponsor ahead of the game. And then we sort of over predicted initially the number of licenses we would need. Um, again, we got kind of advice on that. So we actually used, I think on average, five or six a year. We sort of applied for 10. And again, it was that dialogue between the artist and the administrator so that, you know, making sure they had their contract in time, they had their license in time to come in and out of the country. And then it's just, it, for us, we found it very straightforward process, but I think we were very lucky that we had a very organized administrative artist. <laughs> it was to get, and only one artist that we were sponsoring, not obviously hundreds. And she was working with us for a six month block, but it actually did prove quite straightforward and the, and the home office were very easy to get through to um, either by email, they keep us regularly informed. And then obviously at the end of the year, you are committed. The thing not to forget is you have to fill out a tax return on their behalf. So that's a very easy thing to sort of forget. We actually found the process, I imagined it was going to be very painful and I found it less painful. So again, I'm really happy with my contact details. If anyone does want any advice, because being a smaller company, we went through it and found it quite straightforward. And myself and my assistant producer navigated it from knowing nothing and the way to sort of do it so we're happy to without taking up time now to if anyone wants to email me or Ian and get that information be happy oh. one, one thing I, sorry no, one, thing I, really. one thing I would say just to finish this off mm -hmm. is that coming into the UK it's sometimes a lottery about where, how much your, your artists or people coming into the UK are checked mm -hmm. it's why officially to be a, a US person coming into the UK, you only need a certificate of sponsorship, which whatever that cost is. However, it's recommended, depending on who the entry officer is that's checking, it's recommended you get a visa as well. Yes. So it's, it's this old story about who's going to check. It depends who you get at the time. Yeah, we did get, just to finish that, we did get into a bit of a loop when we were trying to do a festival in Southern Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland. And, yeah. came quite, uh, and we couldn't break this loop of how on earth to get the performer there. We did in the end. And then the same with then that performer going into Europe, but because she was obviously living in France with French residency, it became easier. But that was a bit of complexity again, that that took a little bit. We were panicking because it was getting nearer to the date and we seemed to be locked in an administrative loop which we did in the end break. So again, very happy if people want to get in contact for that without taking too much time now. Yeah. Um, thank you both. Um, as I said, I think we'll try to gather as much uh, information as possible that is as clear as possible as we go in the next months and we'll try to share that. So we'll continue working with artists and you know, experts of the field. So um, keep checking our website. Um, in terms of what you were saying around, you know, the, the cost, and I think there's been quite a lot of talk on the chat around sort of festivals or networks or uh, organizations sharing the cost of, um, of the certificates of sponsorship and in general, the, the cost of bringing an artist over to the UK or vice versa. Um, I think these are mostly comments, but if uh, any of you wants to wants to say anything about this, please feel free to do so. I think um, Camille and Dom, probably you have quite a bit of experience around uh, European um, networks. And also, Ian, if you've got any sort of knowledge from the music industry, please feel free uh, to share it. Um, Maggie was saying that uh, because of the uh, combination of Brexit, and COVID and climate change, uh, we will all have to explore new models of touring um, and we'll probably have to look at resources and money available for artists and producers who are able to suggest new models in this context. And then Molly Sharp was actually asking if there are any good examples of consortiums of producing organizations and artists coming together to share costs and knowledge and resources for European touring. Um, Camille, do you do you have any comments around this, or or Dom, or anybody else actually? I oh. hmm. go for I... it, Ian. Ian. Oh yeah, okay. What what I was going to say, I've got a really terrible example. 
<laughs> I'm sure most of us out there in the creative arts industry know of Live Nation. Um, Live Nation is one of the biggest consortiums, if not the biggest consortium in the world. And talking about sharing costs, what Live Nation were reported to have done last week was renegotiating all artist contracts for rescheduled shows for 2021, whereby the artists would reduce all their fees by 20%. And so the artists would absorb the costs or management companies. Um, there's a, been a big reaction to that within the music industry. Um, let's put it this way. I'm not the biggest fan of Live Nation, um, coming from where I come from. Um, in terms of what we do but there's been a big reaction back now in reality what's going to happen post brexit and post covid is what i'm seeing as i mentioned in a chat previously to our my colleagues here is that there is a sort of balance that's beginning to be achieved with artists and festivals um, and management, those that are being sensible there's a rebalancing where people are being sensible and know that there's only so much work there and only so much economically that can be done at the moment um, so the big touring shows the really big ones um, are not going to be asking for quite as much but then again on other sides of the um, uh, the creative arts I know that Cirque du Soleil have gone into administrative bankruptcy recently in order to achieve um, stability in their company so I think we're talking about the Live Nation thing where Live Nation is looking after Live Nation and not necessarily the artists or the shows and they some will go to the wall and then the other side is the industry is reacting back trying to make sure there's some fairness but also to maintain the fact there are both promoters and artists I'm not just talking about music that will survive so that we still have a touring circuit that's been my recent experience any any other comments I was just because I think Camille's comment was very interesting, actually, with touring wider um, abroad that actually, you know, you go to Australia, we've been to Korea, we've been to China, it, absolutely given that those festivals pay those costs of car and eight freight visas. Yeah. And, um, and I suppose, I guess it, we are carrying that sort of, <laughs> even though it's not, <laughs> we're carrying that sort of professional guilt. We didn't want Brexit. Our European partners didn't ask for it. So we're feeling like we need to swallow it. I think, the next year, I think I will definitely be building in and then hopefully down the line we can negotiate. Mm. Um, in terms of sort of consortiums coming together, I know some useful information coming out, obviously, from UK theatres, from ITC, from Outdoor Arts, from Extra. It says, you know, we're beginning to put it together. And I think going forward now, you know, we've obviously got dealt a huge blow with COVID that now obviously everyone, the second half of the year, is going to have to start focusing on Brexit and what it means. So... Hopefully that will bring some more consortiums together and sharing knowledge, um, hopefully. And yeah, and hopefully in time we can come to an agreement with our European festivals and partners. But obviously it's unexpected cost for everyone in a way, isn't it? And still, yeah. I'm, I'm say. I was just going to respond to Maggie's comment as well about new ways of working. And I think we've, I think over the last few months, we've probably all developed new ways of working remotely um, in terms of uh, digital um, and, ha and, and how that can be incorporated into the work that we all do. Um, I know some artists who are looking at digital alternatives, especially when it comes to maybe residencies and creative residencies and how they may be interacting there. But um, it's going to be a balance because, you know, our work is is built and set outdoors. Essentially, it's what we do. We respond to landscapes and to uh, to to nature, and I think that it's really important that we continue to be able to do so. But um, yeah, there may maybe ways that are more environmentally friendly as well of us instead of having to travel around that also will reduce maybe some of these visa carnet costs. Mm -hmm. Can I just throw something to the rest of the group that may be of interest to the viewers? Um, I think there's also something we've not touched upon at all in the conversation so far, and that's the impacts of loss of funding from sources like Creative Europe, <laughs> because UK-based companies are not going to be able to access that funding. And obviously that will have an impact on Arts Council England and the way in which that does that. It might, maybe my colleagues have some... Uh, uh, comments on that. 
if I can say just a, a word about that, I think, um, yeah, this is something that actually in the sector has been discussed a lot. Um, I think Dom has got um, quite a bit of knowledge around it. I think the CMS is looking at um, ways in, in which it can replace that scheme. But of course, it's going to lack the sort of, you, you know, um, multilaterality of, uh, the, of the funding. And so, rather than having funding being um, shared and the, and the work um, being shared across the partners, it's gonna be more, I think, funding goes to UK organizations in order to work internationally. So of course, that's very, very different from Creative Europe as we know it. Dom, do you have any, any comments? Yeah, I think, you know, as I touched on when I was speaking earlier, it's really, we, we've done some Creative Europe partnerships where we've, you know, we've maybe done more of the work, but haven't necessarily been officially the lead partner um, on the project. But it, it's difficult because the the European partners, you, you have to justify your presence in that in that grouping um it's not we're not seen as a as a lead nation now so um the the purpose of having us there is is maybe questionable so it is about developing those good relationships we also had a very interesting discussion among the panel uh, a few days ago about european offices and uh estonian e-nationality and about whether <laughs> You know, about, yeah, yeah. yeah way, ways of getting around uh, being a UK-based uh, company and uh, having uh, yeah. outposts elsewhere. So, yeah, again, you know, we're, we're all creative people, and we probably will come up with ways of working around that. Thank you, Dom. Um, so, I'm afraid we've run out of time now. Uh, so, we'd like to thank you all for joining us for this day. Um, of definitely really interesting discussions. Um, and a special thank you goes to our speakers for their invaluable contributions and for keeping us engaged, even if essentially talking to a screen, I can tell you that it's not easy. Uh, I think we can uh, all agree that this conversation still should be a vector for further, um, for further discussions. Um, so please, if you would like to share any thoughts about today, both uh, on the side of the East Asian panel and also on Brexit and any of the conversations that we had this morning during the networking session, uh, please get in touch with us. I would also like to remind you that uh, you will have received an artist booklet um, today with uh, information on, on the artistic program uh, of Stockton International Riverside Festival 2020. Uh, so we encourage you to find out more about these and to make valuable connections with the artists. Also, uh, the Surfaton program uh, continues both today and tomorrow. So please check the website, the Surf website. Uh, you can find the link again in the description. Um, finally, as you will probably guess, you will receive a feedback form in the next, in the next couple of weeks. Um, this is really crucial to advocate for activities like these to continue, and it will also help us to ensure that we're providing uh, meaningful content in the future. Once again, thank you to our listeners and to our wonderful speakers, and we hope you will join us for the coming sessions. Have a lovely weekend. <laughs>